Welcome back to the weekly news roundup. This is the privacy and the security editions. These are recorded live Fridays, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on several different platforms. Have a look at the website, switch to linux.com slash live to see what the current links are. Are. Uh, no, you can't watch the show live over there right now. Uh, that's just where I happen to have the links to show you where it is. Things are in flux. You know, if the Tubies decides I need to get kicked off, then you, know, you can always find out where the show is over there. And with that, let's go ahead and get diving on in. Homework help site Chegg accused of leaking user data. This is um, now Chegg has had a lot of different applications. They've done textbook rentals, they've done tutorial services, a lot of different things. Uh, basically, they have had four major data breach type incidents, most of them relating to multi factor um, acts, uh, authentication, and uh, S3 colanders. Um, which if you're new around here, that is an S3, an Amazon AWS S3 bucket. I call them colanders because even Amazon apparently has a hard time securing them. Uh, as they leaked a bunch of data as we covered, I think it was last week. Uh, basically, the F uh, FTC listed four separate events, two involving exposure of payroll information of scammers, one the leaking of sensitive material online, and another where the executive's email uh, account was compromised. And basically, they, uh, they're they being sued on the basis of having excessively poor security for the size of company they are. And this is nothing new. These companies do this all the time. They, they simply have a great idea. It's probably two guys, you know, full-time guys working in their basement or something, and then uh, they subcontract out everything else to the cheapest bidder. And, uh, you know, the guy over at the call center in Calcutta who also runs the scam centers uh, puts together a proposal to do the things at half the budget of anybody else and stuff like that. And so, you know, we end up with really poor security, or maybe it's intentionally poor. Who really knows? But that's what's going on over at Chegg. Um, in one case, attacker stole W2 information for 700 current and former employees, including birth dates and social security numbers. They were not deleting information after it was no longer needed. There are a lot of problems with this company. Uh, they are a company that uh, we used to work side, uh, side by side with them from the one startup that I worked with in the ed tech sector. So it's not one that I'm totally uh, ignorant of. Uh, TikTok tells its European users that its staff in China will indeed get access to their data. Uh, so screw you, GDPR. Um, <laughs> and basically, um, this has been going around. You know, we, you've heard that you know TikTok has problems. We need to ban TikTok, and then Orange Man Bad wanted to TikTok ban TikTok, and now TikTok's the greatest thing in the world because Orange Man Bad wanted to ban it. Um, and so then TikTok struck a deal with the United States government to say, oh, we no longer are concerned about this kind of stuff. Yeah, there's something shaky wasn't going on the back door there. I mean, we know of the close associations between certain persons uh, attend uh, that happen to live in some house that happens to be white in Washington, D.C. and the Chinese government. And so, hmm, uh, very interesting. Um, but in response to this, TikTok tells European users specifically uh, that its staff in China will get to see their data. How does this happen? Well, it doesn't have anything to do with data in Europe. Is there? It's that the data in Europe is spread across a couple different countries. And what's really fascinating about this, if you look into it, is European data is stored in different Five Eyes countries. This is so that all of the individual governments can spy on all of the individual people and all spy and, and uh, snitch on all of the individual governments uh, about the citizens that the governments are not allowed to spy on directly, but the Five Eyes nations can and then just Sure. We'll be glad to tell you the things about Bob Jones over in London. If you can please tell us about that crazy switch to Linux guy over there. And we don't even know what state he's in because every single time he logs into some account, it's in a different place. Please tell us what's going on. Sorry, we can't help you. The guy apparently has blocked our TikTok tracking pixels. I have a video on that if you want to block the TikTok tracking pixels too. And by the way, you might say, oh, I'm not using TikTok. <laughs> what I look like crazy. It doesn't matter. TikTok tracks you whether you use use their servers or not because they have convinced everybody and their brother to add that TikTok pixel into their website and you go to any given website, right click, view the source, search for TikTok, guess what? It's probably there. Government sites, education sites, business sites, they're all doing it. The news sites, they're all doing it. They all are tracking data for TikTok because it helps them out in their data collection and their analytics. So I happen to have a video about how you can block TikTok from tracking you and it's going to prevent them from seeing any information 
information about you. Now, this article here is relating directly to the direct user information. So this is not, you know, Joe Blow, whatever else. This is the people who actually have information uh, because they're actually the fools that use this nonsense. Um, and so that is certainly an issue that uh, we have there. Um, all ties to the Five Eyes. Which, If you're unfamiliar with the Five Eyes, this is a association of five different countries. If I remember them off the top of my head, uh, United States, I think it's United States, Germany, UK, New Zealand, and uh, Australia maybe. That might be it. Don't quote me exactly. You can look it up. Basically, it's a alignment of five governments that uh, they're not allowed to directly spy on their citizens, so they share data because, you know, Germany's uh, Gestapo can spy on me and the CIA can spy on them, and they can just kind of share data. Uh, that's kind of what that is talking about. All right. Um on to the next one. Um, this one could have been under security, could have been under privacy. I wanted to cover it under privacy because it highlights a malicious use of a VPN, albeit this is a different way than, you know, uh, many of them can work. So basically what was going on is there is a new religion that is cropping up in e, um, uh, in uh, um, Muslim nations. And of course, if you happen to live in a Muslim nation that is, uh, survives by Sharia law, you are not allowed to practice another religion, at least not freely. Um, so you can, in theory, if you're paying separate taxes for being an infidel, uh, you can do that. They, they mildly tolerate you, but you are a second class citizen. So there is a new, um, religion going around, uh, in these areas. And, um, of course, since you are not really allowed to search for things, they, uh, the forums and stuff talking about it, they are pushing this new VPN. And if you use this VPN, they say that, yeah, you can get around the censorship. They're promoting this in telegram channels and things like that. Um, the faith is, uh, is it the Baha'i faith? I think I, I know nothing about it. Uh, but it is a separate faith. that's going to be a divergent from the Muslims. So in those Islam based countries, you're not allowed to have other faiths, at least not freely, as we said. And so this the people pushing this faith are pushing this VPN, uh, which is a side-loaded VPN, and when you install it, it's going to install along with it um, the Sandstrike system, which is going to be able to spy on everything. Now, you need to understand this, and this is why I put it in the privacy section. When you are talking about a VPN, you have to be tr completely trust your VPN because the VPN might block your ISP from seeing your traffic. It certainly doesn't block Google or anybody else that you're logged into from seeing your traffic. Okay. It will not block any of that. All right. Um, uh, but what it will block is your ISP from seeing your traffic. The problem is every single thing you do on that device can be seen by the VPN company. We don't even know who this VPN company is. Um, so some unknown person who is co-installing uh, malware um, <laughs> is now being able to access absolutely everything on these people's devices. So be cautious about VPNs. Not everybody needs a VPN all the time. Um, there's times for it. There's times not. I know everyone says you need a VPN because everyone's trying to make money on selling VPNs and things like that. Um, there are specific times to need it. There are specific times it makes zero sense whatsoever. And so you need to understand that. And we have a video about that too. We have a lot of videos on this channel. I need to start linking them better. All right. Um, moving on, Google Assistant uh, just became more kid-friendly and a little safer, too. <laughs> safer for whom? So, this deals with Google Assistant, which is specifically supposed to be like, you know, 18 plus, maybe you're 14 plus, but they find out that so many children use it. How do we know this? <laughs> because Google takes a lot of data about what, I, I, what is it with the modern trend? I see it a lot. Like, modern trend, people just pick up the phone, hitting the microphone and talking into it. And say, you know, it's faster to type your texts than it is to say them and then look at it. And then you're giving all that information to whoever's listening behind the curtain, which is usually some third party, uh, third world country uh, contractors. So now you got the third world country contractors listening in on your children. Um, 
So that's kind of creepy in and of itself, but they realize that, oh, more, more and more kids are using this system. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create a new kid-friendly one. It's going to have a simpler dictionary with more simplified answers to dumb down the children even more than they're already being dumbed down. Uh, see uh, Charles Sykes' books, Dumbing Down Our Kids, for more information. Uh, according to the announcement, the feature works by having the assistant recognize that a child is speaking and understanding that it is being asked a question. Google gives the example of a child asking what a telescope is and the child receiving a basic definition instead of a more complicated one. Of course, to use this, you have to set up your whole kid family account and then you have to give voice prints of your child to Google and then they're going to have the Google stuff. And by the way, they're still going to take all that information and ship it off to some third world nation where some weirdo in some third world nation is going to be able to listen in to the voice of your child, analyzing it for all the things and making making sure that the product works the best it can possibly work. Um, and so I would advise you, um, first and foremost, there's no reason you need to be having some voice-activated stuff for any company. It doesn't matter if it's Google or Amazon or Apple. None of them. None of them. Unless you're using uh, the open-source Minecraft system uh, to, do, uh, to do whatever you're doing, um, you do not be speaking into your devices. Every company... Apple's cares about privacy, which is why they were explicitly caught shipping the stuff off to third world countries for real human beings to listen and analyze those things. Like, why ship it to people who don't actually understand the na the language natively? You'd figure that's a really bad quality control if you're trying to see, did the device give me the right response? Let's ship it to some guy with English as their second language and subpar education to tell us. That sounds like a wonderful quality control idea. But that's what they do. All of them do this. Microsoft was caught doing this. Google was caught doing this. Apple was caught doing this. Samsung was caught doing this. Have I missed anybody? And so... Um, Bottom line, don't sign your kids up for this. Don't use it yourself. Teach your children not to talk to electronic devices because those electronic devices are going to come around and you know, destroy us in the future. Well, if you'd like to help support the channel, we do have affiliates. Today we are highlighting Pro Writing Aid. Um, this is in celebration of the novel November. Um, there's a few different names for it. The plan where authors want to write a whole book in the month of November. Well, if you need a writing uh, assistant, I use Pro Writing Aid myself to do the final AI uh, grammar check on my books and stuff. Um, not the first few, which is why you'll find a few more errors in the first few, but the last couple ones, we've started to use this, and it works really well. Uh, TLM.li forward slash PWA for Pro Writing Aid is going to give you 20% off a, an annual or a lifetime subscription, and that will help support the channel. Channel as well. So Pro Writing Aid is an excellent service. It is very much like Grammarly, only Grammarly started out by having a clause in their terms of service saying, oh, we're, we're going to collect and analyze your data. And they dropped that since then. But Pro Writing Aid has never had that. They've never logged in and logged your data, stored it, analyzed it, and things like that. And so have a look over at them. If you are working on a novel, you can drop. And what I usually do is I just copy and paste it into the web-based interface and then uh, fix and transfer anything over like that. Well, guys, let's head on over to security next. And uh, first up in security, there was a GitHub flaw that could have allowed attackers to take over repositories. Like everything else, we have to have some pithy name, and this pithy name was called Repo Jacking. What it had to do with is if you were using a GitHub account and you changed your name, while well, your name was in the URL for the account. And for a while, those would just kind of go into some suspended animation. So if some scammer recognized you changed your account and then changed their name to that name, they could hijack your account by the link being crossed over. Now, there has since been an update which is going to fix this, but this was so critical that if somebody had taken over a supply chain um, a supply chain uh, repository, they could have easily distributed malware nearly instantly across the world. That's how serious this was. Now, this has been fixed, um, but um, basically had to do with if somebody changed your username, the username was part of the repo, and so the scammer could take the username and uh, steal the repository. So, 
Uh, this has been patched, but uh, it is definitely a fascinating uh, trip through uh, how bad some of these things can be if a vulnerability happens. Well, the raspberry robin worm, um, this actually started spreading around just about um, a year ago, September 2021. It was fairly benign. I can't even remember if we covered it last year or not. Uh, this is another one of these ones that ran by spreading on a USB drive. I remember fighting these things. There was one of these uh, malware by USB drive going around the uh, campus where I was teaching and we had I think we had like 30 little micro PCs in there and every like every single day at the end of lab I'd have to go in there and <laughs> just clear all the malware off of all those things uh, and so it was crazy because students of course carrying around this is before the cloud infrastructure existed so students were carrying on USB drives so this is spread around by USB drive and for a while saying oh this is interesting what's this thing doing nobody really cared and nobody really paid any attention well, after it was spread around for a while and nobody really paid any attention, it updated itself to start doing crazy things. Yay! <laughs> and so um, most computer systems in the modern world are going to be immune to this because it requires you to actively participate two separate times. The first is you actually need to actively turn, um, open the link. The second is you actually have to actively uh, download a file. I think you actually have to actively execute the file as well. So it could be three separate actions you would need to take. Of course, if you have the auto run on USB drives, which was common before, um, you know, until not too recently, you'd plug in a USB drive, it would auto run, and then it would immediately download and then prompt you to install the software. Uh, that's what it was doing. So what it's doing now is it's adding some back doors to get in and install just some basic spyware, malware, and things like that. So um, uh, it does work by the um, macro links, which is the new way. Instead of macros uh, being used in Office documents, now they're using link files instead uh, to do that. So that's kind of how this guy is working. Next up, uh, Brownville police. Um, this is uh, assume this might be happening in every city. Um, basically, they're saying scammers claim to be law enforcement and demand money over Zella or Cash App. I got news for you guys. If any government, whether it's a police officer, an FBI agent, an IRS agent, FTC, um, DHS, um, ABC, DEF, GHI, and LGBTQ+, no matter what, if they come to you saying they're the law, they're not going to be asking for money over Zella or Cash App or gift cards or iTunes cards or things like this. Okay, they're not going to do that. Use a little bit of common sense here. They come in, you're about to be arrested, but if you give us $10,000 on Zella right now, you'll be free. Pfft. Uh, I'll go and get the gift cards. Okay, you want me to stay on the phone? Okay, and then drive to the nearest police station, hand it to the guy behind the desk. Okay, let them figure it out. So, um, <laughs> that's kind of the thing. Uh, just a fun little one. Uh, so, what they're saying here, their advice, if you if you get a call from one such scammer, get the caller's name, phone number, and agency. Tell them you're going to contact the agency with the warrant, not the number they gave you. Uh, call the agency that has the warrant and verify the person by name. Get the agency's phone number via the internet. If it was a scam, report it immediately. There you go. Yeah. So, so if uh, if you do somebody does say and claim to have a warrant, you know, I don't know. I, if they got like a city marked police cars and they're gonna handcuff you, okay, maybe. Um, whatever. <laughs> All right. Well, our last one here is another reason to run ad blockers. So a crime group hijacks hundreds of U.S. news websites to push malware. They did this by compromising a JavaScript library that is used to spread advertisements on apparently hundreds of popular U.S. news outlets. And they did this. Um, now, of course, these guys, like, we've identified these, and they're not telling us which organizations they are. It leads me to believe I have to assume the worst. New York Times, Washington Post, um, LA Times, The Atlantic, you know, all these 
crazy one. Just assume it's them and just stop watching them for a while. You know, I mean, I don't know. Uh, we, after all, we know if it was if it were guys that were actually doing good journalism, they would tell us exactly who they are, reminding us about their links to uh, things we can't mention on the tubies. So, uh, just assume it's probably the big players in the field. But basically, they did it by compromising a JavaScript library. The JavaScript library would go in there and they would download things. This was linked to the advertisements they were doing, and it was actually linked to the video, uh, the videos as well. Probably video ads is my guess, uh, but it was not very clear. So the uh, it's called Sock Ghoulish Malware Injected in a Benign JavaScript File was loaded in the news outlet's website. Prompts the website visitors to download the fake software. Uh, this one did require you to download the software and then execute it, and it's targeting Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, and Edge, and Opera. Um, I'm pretty safe except for that whole Firefox, eh, except it's kind of like download.exe. You have no power here, Gandalf the Grey. Um, so, you know, um, that's that one. So just be aware. Um, no script would also have blocked this. So no script or ad blockers would have taken care of this. Uh, you block origin privacy brat badger probably would block this. I don't know about privacy badger, but just yet another reason to block those. Well, if you'd like to help support the channel, we do have a subscribe star page because some people don't like the other mainstream options. Subscribestar.com slash switched to Linux. You can jump on over there. It gets you some behind the scenes access to the uh, supporter streams and anything else I throw up there that uh, the general population doesn't get to see. Anyway, with that, thanks for watching and we will see you next time. Thank you for watching this video from Switched to Linux. This channel would not be possible without the backing of the program supporters scrolling on the screen now. You can be a supporter at Patreon at patreon.com slash T-O-M-M or at thinklifemedia.com. I also want to thank the open source community who creates such excellent software that makes producing this show possible. Please remember to support your software communities. Thank you, and I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.